Tailoring collars. This is something that I have heard many people find really intimidating. That kind of makes sense given all of the information that's out there. There is lots of contradicting people telling you you should do it this way and you should do it that way and there's not a lot of whys. There's not a lot of detailed explanations of why you might choose one way over another way. I am here to demystify the collar and tell you not only how I like to tailor collars but also the why behind everything so that hopefully you have some information in context that will actually help you with your own tailoring projects. Now I'm not an expert on tailoring but I have done this quite a few times and done a lot of research, read books, watched videos. I think that I can give you some helpful and useful information here. Uh, we are going to talk about materials, stitches, uh, stitch arrangement, pad stitching, orientation, how to actually do the pad stitching, and then at the end how to press shape into your collar so that it'll actually fit. This video will be time stamped if you would like to skip ahead to a certain part. I am assuming that you already know how to hand sew. I do have a video that goes into hand sewing in detail and how to hold the needle, how to use a thimble, and all of that, so if you want to check that out I will link it in the top right corner. But yeah, let's get into it. So first of all, materials. You need to tailor a collar, a under collar fabric, which is usually a felt, it has to be a natural fiber felt, or melton, which is like a very tightly woven and like almost felted wool fabric. You can also use other fabrics like just a, a mid-weight or heavyweight wool. I don't recommend using a synthetic fabric for the main reason that you can't press shape into a synthetic fabric the way you can with wool. The reason that you go with something a little bit thicker is because it's easier to make your stitches less visible and to have more shape and more body in your collar if you go with a more heavyweight fabric. So in a lot of lighter weight, modern suiting fabric kind of tailored garments, you'll see the under collar is made of a thicker, sturdier fabric or a felt. It is for that purpose. You also need canvas. Now there are specific collar canvases that are very, very stiff. You don't need to use one. You can use a heavier or even mid-weight chest canvas. You can also use buckram, which is a waxed linen canvas, which is what I will be using today. It will give you a less stiff collar than a collar canvas, but it is enough structure to create a nice tailored collar. It's just not going to be like a statue. Now, both your under collar and your canvas need to be cut on the bias. If you're using a felt, of course, there is no grain line, so you just cut it however, but if you're using a fabric that has a grain line, it should be cut on a true bias. You can cut your under collar as two separate pieces and put a seam in the center back. And the way that you do this is like I have here, you just take the two layers of fabric and overlap them like this. You don't want to do a normal seam where you would sew right sides together and like press it open because that will create too much bulk at the center back. So what I've done here is literally, literally just taken the two sides, overlap them, and then sewn a little rectangle, which the ends will get cut off, but it's basically just two lines of stitching. The raw edges will be entirely covered up in the final garment so you don't have to worry about them. So I have my outer fabric and I have my canvas and now we're gonna put that away for a minute and talk about pad stitching and pad stitching designs. This is scrap paper from a pattern test print. Love reusing scrap paper. So a pad stitch. You may have seen it before. It is a stitch that ends up looking like a bunch of diagonal lines. It's used to put two layers of fabric together. It's the same stitch as a diagonal basting stitch, uh, except those are generally done much larger and with basting thread and a basting needle, but it is the same stitch. So I'll draw it here on the paper. You would have the thread on the outside comes across and then I'll do a dotted line for where it's not seen on the outside and then it comes across. So stitches that look like this. And then you would turn around and come back up the other side and get something that looks like this. So if you have looked at pad stitching, you may have seen both of these. Sometimes the two little lines meet at the same level horizontally and sometimes they are staggered. So personally I think staggered is the way to go because it spreads out the points where you're connecting the two pieces of fabric together more evenly whereas if you have your stitches matched up at the same level you're getting two places where you're sewing the fabric together really close and then you have more space and then two places that are really close instead of 
staggering them and spreading them out more evenly. Now let's talk about stitch size. So if you are pad stitching something that doesn't need a lot of shape or a lot of structure, you might do larger pad stitches, like almost up to half an inch. Whereas if you're doing something that needs a lot of curve, like the edge of a roll on a lapel, you may want to do really tiny pad stitches, like an eighth of an inch or even a little bit less. The way that pad stitches are used to put curve into something is that you attach these two layers of fabric in a curve. So one is permanently slightly shorter and one is permanently longer and that creates a curve that is sewn into the fabric. When you pad stitch to put in a curve, the curve is generally going parallel to your rows of pad stitching. So for this right here, my pad stitches are going this way. The curve would be like this, which the paper is not curving with me, but the curve would go like this not like this. Whichever way your rows are going, that is parallel to the roll line of whatever you're sewing, generally. Now, you will see arrangements of pad stitching or designs of pad stitching on a collar where this is not strictly true. Usually when you see that, you see someone pressing shape into a collar more than they are pad stitching it into the collar, and that works. Um, but what I like to do and what a lot of people like to do is arrange your pad stitching in such a way that the curve that the pad stitching is creating is already going in the right direction. So for example, here we have this collar and it's supposed to go like this. Short little collar anatomy. You have the roll line, which is this line right here, the line where it's going to fold. You have the stand, which is the bottom part here, which is gonna go against the neck. And then you have the fall, which is the outer part that you're gonna see when it's folded. So this collar would go around my neck here with the stand next to my neck, fold at the roll line, and then the fall comes down on the outside and it looks like this. So if you imagine the collar is like this, obviously the roll line is where you want it to roll, but then at this part, you probably don't want this little edge to like flap up awkwardly, unless you do, unless it's a stylistic thing, but generally you would want this edge to stay down. So at this part of the collar, you want your pad stitching to at least kind of bring this in. So here is my little drawing of a collar, and I'm gonna show you the direction that I like to pad stitch. So first you go along the roll line, and then I like to do long horizontal lines this way along the stand. Some people will go this way. Either way works. And then from the, let's see, so this is the center. Um, some people will do their rows this way across the collar, which will give you a lot of roll in this direction. Um, but I like to do them diagonally this way because it gives me not only a roll this way, but also at the end here, it keeps the collar from flapping up. And it also is a way that you don't have to switch the direction, because what some people will do, I'll draw it on both sides. So this is how I like to do it. What some people will do is go this way, and then switch at the end, and have two different directions of pad stitching. Which you can do, but it requires you to switch in the middle. Um, it just kind of depends where you want to emphasize the curve the most. You can get almost exactly the same results with a bunch of different arrangements of pad stitching. This is just why I like this one. Now we're actually going to start doing it, and we're going to start with drawing in the roll line, which is optional, not something that everyone does, but I will explain why I do it and how to do it right now. Well, not right now, because first we have to baste it together. We have the collar cut on the bias, we have the under collar also cut on the bias. I'm laying them together, and now we're just going to baste these together just for the purpose of them not coming apart as we pad stitch. You will have to take out the basting stitches as you pad stitch. And there are multiple ways that people baste. I like to just do large diagonal basting stitches all the way across. And if I didn't explain before, you have to cut these on the bias because in order to shape and stretch this, you're going to be stretching both the top and the bottom. And if it was on the straight grain or even the cross grain, you probably wouldn't be able to stretch it enough to get enough shape into this collar for it to actually fit around your neck. So it being on the bias is very, very important. This is now basted together, not everywhere, just right down the middle. To start, some people will go right into doing small pad stitches along the roll line, but what a lot of people do is sew the roll line with a straight seam. So you can do this on the machine with a normal machine straight stitch and just sew right along the roll line. You can also do this by hand with a back stitch or a running back stitch or a running stitch. 
or you can draw it in by hand, which is what I like to do. And this helps to keep the top edge of the collar sitting really close to the neck and not kind of gaping out. In order to do this, you need to use a really, really strong thread. Normal thread will not cut it here, it will snap. Preferably a thick Taylor's linen thread. You can also use upholstery thread, not ideal, but it works. And we're going to sew a small running stitch along the roll line. To start off, I won't be doing a knot, I'm just going to do two back stitches kind of on top of each other. It's important as you do this that there are no knots because knots will create too much bulk and you'll be able to feel the knot through the fabric. So I've done two little back stitches, I'm going to go ahead and do little running stitches all along the roll line. So once you get to the other end of your roll line, now you can take your thread and pull on it and gather up the roll line. So you can start to see the fabric puckering on either side of this, but you want to not pull it so much that you have actual gathers or folds of fabric. It's just to create a really strong tension along the roll line. And here you can see we're already starting to create this shape where you have a shorter distance on the middle and then both outsides are longer. And if I even right now start to fold this collar up like it's around a neck, you can see just how much pulling in the roll line helps to create this shape. So, personally, I think that this is a really important step. It's not something that people always do, but it is a way to really increase the shape of the collar that you're tailoring. Once you've pulled it in enough, you can go ahead and do the same tie off that you did to tie on by doing two or three little back stitches to secure your thread. And again, if you try to do this with a thread that is a normal weight, normal strength, um, it will break because this is literally the only thread that is going in this direction. Remember, the fabric is not, the fabric is on the bias, and then your pad stitches are going in this zigzag shape. There's literally only one thread to take all of the strain for this part, so if you don't go with a super strong thread, it, it's gonna snap. Now that my thread is tied off, I'm just going to cut it, and we're gonna get into the actual pad stitching. So I have the fall of the collar towards my working hand, my right hand, and the stand towards my left hand where I'm going to hold it. I like to start by doing a row of pad stitches right over that roll line. So first I'm taking about an eighth of an inch stitch perpendicular to the roll line right where the collar starts, not in the seam allowance, but inside the actual shape of the collar. I'm gonna do a small back stitch over it to tie the thread off. Again, no knots. I'm gonna be using about an eighth of an inch wide and tall pad stitch. So it's pretty small. And I'm folding the roll line over my pointer finger of my non-sewing hand towards me, like this. So it's underneath the roll line and I'm folding it over and then you can even take the other finger and hold the fabric like this. It's not always possible. Taking an eighth of an inch down and taking an eighth of an inch wide stitch. I'm kind of rolling the fabric between my fingers and as you get more pad stitches, like after your first row, you'll be able to do this a little bit more, but I'm rolling the fabric like this between my fingers in order to increase the difference in the amount of room that is in each layer. Because in order to create the curve, you need your two layers to be different lengths. Like the outside of the curve needs to be longer and the inside of the curve needs to be shorter. So to create that, I'm not only holding it over a curve, but I'm also actively increasing that amount of roll by rolling the fabric between my fingers. And you do have to be really careful with this because if you overdo it, you can create actual puckers um, and you don't want that. That'll make your collar not lay nice and smoothly. So you have to do it very subtly. If you're at a part of the pad stitching where you need a really intense curve, like the lapel roll line or the collar roll line, adding a little bit extra by rolling the fabric between your fingers instead of just folding it over your fingers can be really helpful. And ideally, as you do this, you're only catching a little bit of the outer fabric so that your stitches don't show too much on the outside. It can be quite difficult to make this actually the case, and you'll get better at it with time, but it's more important that you actually catch the fabric than that it's not visible, because at the end of the day, this part of the collar is going to be on the inside. Also, don't use contrasting thread like I am. Use a thread that matches your outer fabric so that your stitches show less. So once you get to the end here, I've run out of thread, so I'm gonna have to start a new thread, but instead of going back to the beginning and sewing another row in the same direction, we're gonna start 
right where we ended and come back up next to it. And that is how you get that herringbone effect rather than having all of your diagonal lines going in the same direction. You can increase your stitch size a little bit as you go down the stand because you don't need curve in the stand, you really just need the curve at and around the roll line. So I've increased my stitches to be closer to a quarter inch and as you increase your stitch size, you won't be able to perfectly stagger your stitches. That's okay, just kind of work with it. Some of them are gonna be close, some will be staggered. If you're doing the opposite, some of them would end up being staggered, it's okay. Don't worry about it too much. You can do like an exact double size increase so you could do exactly every other stitch and keep your stitch pattern just depends how much you want to increase i'm going to switch over to the other side of the collar because the sun is going down and i need the light to film so for the fall i'm actually going to use a pencil and draw out guidelines for where my lines of stitching will be and you can absolutely do this you've seen this in a few of my videos uh it's just helpful to keep your angle and to keep your stitching consistent on both sides to have a bit of a guideline i'm not going to draw a guideline for every single uh row so now to start on the fall of the collar. We're going to be doing the same thing in that snake pattern, except going parallel to these lines that I've just drawn, which are diagonal. And they're technically on the straight grain or cross grain of the canvas. So you can kind of use that as a guideline or if you're using a canvas that already has stripes on it. But I've just drawn out some stripes to help me keep my stitching consistent. So for this, I'm gonna use uh, these slightly larger pad stitches like the ones that I'm using farther down the stand. So these are gonna be around a quarter of an inch square. If you imagine like a quarter inch by quarter inch box, this stitch is gonna go from corner to corner on that box. We're going to do the same thing with rolling it over a finger, but because there isn't a hard roll on this line, this is just more of a gentle curve. You don't need to be really aggressive about rolling the fabric between your fingers to create a strong curve. You can a little bit like right next to the roll line with maybe like your first stitch or two, but for the most part, this is a very gentle curve. So same thing, no knots. Sometimes I don't even do the back stitch. There isn't going to be a lot of strain on any individual stitch in this. The idea is to connect these two pieces of fabric over many many stitches over lots of area. The actual strength of any one stitch is not all that important. This is not a construction seam, this is pad stitching. So as you can see here, my diagonal rows of pad stitches are about a quarter of an inch. You can see that they're larger than the ones on the roll line here, and they're already starting to roll the collar slightly right here. So that is what I'm looking for. And I forgot to mention that as you get towards the middle of this, you can start to take out your basting stitches because you should, in theory, be moving the fabric slightly. So the basting stitches over here are no longer holding this in the shape that it needs to be held. So the basting stitches are really just to kind of get started, but once you've anchored these two pieces of fabric together, particularly along the stand and the beginning of the fall, these can go. I'm gonna leave them on the other side because I haven't done it yet. So I have one side of the fall done, one side is almost half done, and then the stand uh, is just missing about a line and a half of pad stitching. But you can already see that it is completely folding along the roll line, and that is because I drew it in with that thick linen thread, and then I did really small and really tight curving pad stitches right over the roll line and then along the stand. So that is wonderful, that's exactly what I wanna see. I'm gonna finish this as quickly as I can and then show you how to press some curve into it. So I have finished pad stitching and put on a sweater because I was cold, and now it's time to press this. So I am using my home iron. But the first thing that I'm gonna do is press this flat, which might seem kind of counterintuitive because we just spent all of this time putting this beautiful curve into the collar, but it's been handled a lot and it's kind of a little bit wonky. So we're gonna first press it flat. As you can see, it's kind of wrinkling up here and I can't quite press it flat. So to do that, I'm going to pull it like this and press it flat this way. So this is where 
The curve is already clearly there, and this is largely because of pulling the roll line in. So now what I'm gonna do is stretch out both of the sides, except for the ends here. So I'll start with the top. I'm gonna press this first portion straight, the first third of the collar is straight, and then along the middle here, I'm going to pull this and curve it. And I'm pressing only on the fall, not on the roll line and not on the stand curving this as much as I can until I get to the last third and then I'll press it straight. The less sloped your shoulders are, the more curve you need to press in. Um, so I'm going to do this a few more times to press a little bit more curve into this. Straight and then we're pulling it, pulling it kind of aggressively into this curve. Okay, so I'm gonna say that that is enough curve for this side, and then now I'm gonna work on the opposite side and do something very similar, except the ends don't need to be straight. I'm pretty much doing the same thing, pressing and pulling this edge as I press. So as you can see now, it is wavy on both sides of the roll line, which means that both this edge and this edge are longer than the middle, which is exactly what we want. So now I'm going to fold it along the roll line. So we'll flip it over and fold it in half right along the roll line, curving the outside uh, as much as we curved it before. So it looks like this, and I'm just gonna pretty much flatten this down along the roll line. And if we flip it over and lay it out, you can see that it looks like a collar. The smallest part is the roll line, and then in both the stand and the fall, it comes out from the roll line, which will help it shape around the neck. So you can now unpress just the end of this crease if you want this to be more of a soft crease. Um, you don't have to, it depends on what you're going for, but that is pretty much it. So I'm gonna unpress the, just the end of the crease. Let me know what your experiences with tailoring and tailoring research have been, if you found this video helpful, if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Also, I do have a coffee page where you can support me, buy my patterns, become a member, see behind the scenes vlogs, all that good stuff, I will put that in the description. And yeah, if you want to see my last tailoring project, which was making a matrix style coat, that will be right over here. You can check it out. Bye!